This is MISC Knowledge Repository. Uh, this challenge had a lot of steps, so I'm just going to give an overview of the solution, and then we'll go through step by step. Um, but in this challenge, we're given an email file. The email file has an attachment. Um, this attachment is a git bundle. And so you can unpack that bundle into a repository and start going through the commits. Um, you find out that there's a whole bunch of commits, and each of the commit modifies a single file called data. And so this data is a wave file, and it plays Morse code. And so each commit has a different wave file, and it's just playing different Morse code. Um, so it's kind of a scripting challenge. You need to go through each of the commits and figure out what that Morse code is saying. Um, after you've done that, um, you find out it's base64. You do some base64 decoding and then a gun zip, I think. And from there, you get the flag. Um, kind of going through step through step. I'm not going to go through too much detail. but um, So this is the, let's take a look at the email. Um, this is the email. Uh, you can see there, this is the plain text message in base64. And this is the attachment. You can see this is the file name. Uh, so you can take this out, uh, base64 decode it, and you'll have that git bundle. Um, and to see what that looks like, uh, I think called AI knowledge, you can just run file on it and you'll see it's a git bundle. Uh, from there to unbundle, I think you do git bundle unbundle, um, and then the, the file. Um, I already have it unbundled in this repository, so I'm not going to do it again, but uh, just like that. I think when you unbundle it too, it's going to tell you what the head commit is. Um, and so from there, you can grab that out and you can check out that specific commit. Cool. Uh, once you have that, like I said, you can keep playing, you'll see these data files. Um, and they are just little wave audios. And like I said, they're all just going to play their own Morse code. Um, and so you can get checkout like this one, get checkout, check out the next one, and you'll find out that you know the, the file is just a little bit different. I, I, I could have taken a hash or something of it, but um, basically just the audio file is different. Um, so like I said, it's a scripting challenge at this point. Um, we need to go through and decode all of these files. So uh, I wrote a little script for that. Um, I found some library called Morse uh, Audio Decoder um, that does a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, but anyways, first we're going to check out the head commit and we're going to go all the way back to the top. We're going to run git rev list head. This is going to give us a list of all the commits uh, in the history for the specific commit. Uh, for each of those, we're going to check out um, that specific commit. We're going to decode the data file uh, into Morse code and then we're going to print it out. I also uh, save all the individual uh, WAV files because they are uh, repeated a couple of times. and. This decoder isn't able to decode all of them, so we're going to have to do some of them by hand. But anyways, we'll print this out. Um, I forget where I saved this. Maybe data? Uh, maybe dump.txt? Yeah, I saved it into dump.txt. And so this is what we got after running that decoder. So we can see sometimes if it's like a long message, you can do it. Um, but some of the shorter ones, like this is definitely not what we wanted. And each one of these brackets is a different commit. Um, so like this longer one, it was able to do it. And if we look at it, it's echo, Quebec uniform, blah, blah, blah. So this is equal sign. So we have equal sign, equal sign, equal sign. Um, like I said, it wasn't able to determine this one, but then we can see some letters like Bravo and India and whiskey. Um, so for this step, now we have to write a decoder to kind of sanitize some of these words and see what this is. And most likely if there's a bunch of equal signs, it's some sort of base64. So I have another script called decoder, which is going to read that chunk. And it's going to convert all the um, phonetic alphabet and weird characters into their correct character. So like Bravo goes to B, Foxtrot goes to F, um, and like this weird one goes to A because the Python library wasn't able to decode it properly. Um, to actually get the correct decoding, like I said, I saved the files. Um, so from here, um, I don't know if you'll be able to hear that, um, but I take this and there's a website I use called Adaptive uh, Morse Code Decoder. Um, this thing's great. Uh, you can just upload the files and it does a good job. Um, it's adaptive, so like you have to, you might have to run it a couple times before it gets the correct word per minute and is able to decode it. But once we have all of them, uh, we can run the decoder and it'll print out all the messages correctly. Uh, and from there, we're just, you know, from chunk to chunk, we're just going to decode everything correctly uh, and print out the message. So we can do Python 3. Cool. So at this point, we have this. Um, I take this over to CyberChef. CyberChef. So it was equal, 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 and then the message. Um, I think I did a reverse first. And then I did a magic. I think I was able to figure it out. Do you want the equal signs at the end? And it's probably going through the git history. So it's starting with this character. It's just, I'm going backwards in history, uh, which is why I did it reverse. Um, if it doesn't work, I do have the, uh, the solution somewhere. Uh, and I was able to get it. So it is from base 32 and then a gun zip. Um, so we can copy that out, and there's the flag. So sun, the monadology is a nice extra read, no flags, though. So interesting challenge. The next challenge is crypto beep boop cryptography. Um, there's a bunch of texts, and we're given a beep boop file. 
If we open up the beep boop file, we'll see it's just a bunch of beeps and boops. Um, at first, I thought maybe this was Morse code, but you do, I think Morse code is more like a ternary code. You definitely need spaces. Um, so instead, I, uh, I figured out that this was a binary. And so we just need to convert these beeps and boops into zeros and one and see what the message says. Um, so to do that, there's a solve script. Uh, we're going to read in the beep boop file. We're going to replace the beeps with zeros and the boops with one. Um, I guess that because uh, if it's ASCII, it's probably going to start with zero. Um, but that was just a guess. Um, then we're going to read that binary. We're going to convert that binary into bytes, and we print out the message. Um, if we print it out again, we can we get this. Um, it doesn't quite look right, but it does have somewhat the right, right format. There's sun and then the, the rest. Um, from here, I took to CyberChef. I figured it was going to be some sort of like ROT13. Um, if you jump it in, uh, you'll figure out, yeah, it is ROT13, and we get the flag. So it is sun, exterminate, exterminate, exterminate. This is Forensics Low Effort Wave. Um, there's a bunch of flavor text, and it talks a lot about wave files and stuff like that, but uh, really you don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, when you download this low effort wave, you'll quickly find out it's actually a PNG image. Um, and if you go through the PNG image, you'll see that there's a bunch of, there's two IN chunks. Normally there should be only be one IN chunk in a PNG. And you'll find out there's a bunch of like I data sections that aren't being used. Um, so this was my hardest challenge. I was trying to do this by hand. Um, so going through the I datas and trying to recreate the Zlib stream um, to see what the rest of the message was. I wasn't really sure what was going on. Like, was it two separate images I'm supposed to convert together or like replace one of them? Um, it was confusing. Eventually, because I had so many solves, I figured there's no way that everyone else was like reversing Zlibs. Um, and then eventually it came to me that this was actually just a known bug. Uh, this was the Acropolis bug that happened on Android. And you're supposed to just use some tool you find online to solve it. Um, so so uh, once you figure that out, uh, the challenge is easy. Um, uh, I found some tool uh, online. I just called it a crappie.py. Um, this tool specifically requires a original width and height. Um, I don't know what the original width and height are, so I just started fuzzing them. Um, so I create a little solve script. And uh, yeah, uh, Python 3, a crappie.py. Uh, I run through different widths that I think it could be. I kept the same height um, and I take in the original and output uh, a new one. And so from there, I'm able just to kind of go through a whole bunch of different images um, real quick and see like, if any of them look like the correct width. Um, eventually at 1080, uh, you, we can kind of see some structure. So if we zoom in on that one, um, you know, definitely not perfect in any way, but if we look here, we can kind of make up the flag. Uh, it's S-U-N, uh, well, that was, uh, and the rest is over here, low effort. So this is Rev Dill. Um, originally this was going to be about pickles, but Pi C sounds close enough to pickle, so I decided to make it about that instead. Uh, and we're given a download Pi C file. So it is a compiled Python file. Um, so the first thing you can do is just take it to one of the online decompilers. Um, here's one, and it's able to successfully uh, decompile this class. So we have class still. Uh, we can see some sun flag, so we know we're in the right direction. If you read the code, you figure out it's basically just going to take a this chunk of stuff. Uh, your flag kind of looks like this, and it's just going to rearrange uh, these blocks around in this order. Um, so to solve it, you just write a little script that kind of undoes that operation. Um, so my solve script for that uh, looks like this. Um, I just take out that ciphertext chunk, and this is the ordering. Uh, I split it into chunks, and then for each of the chunks, I figure out the index of where it's supposed to go, uh, and then we're done. So like first I search for the zero, I see the zeros at the very end. So I take out this chunk, and I append it to the flag, or the I, I construct the flag out of that. Um, you can then take it and uh, take that dil file that we decompiled and just verify it. So you can create a dil instance and then print out this validate function to see if it's actually the flag. and It'll say yes, so uh, you know you have the flag. Uh, and the flag was just some random text. The next challenge is rev first state. Um, there's some flavor text, and we're given a pdx.zip file. Um, I didn't know this at the time, but I guess first date is kind of like a Game Boy sort of thing. Um, I guess it's coming out soon, and so we're given um, kind of like a game cartridge, I guess. Uh, and we need to reverse it and figure out how to get the flag. Uh, Playdate actually has a really nice simulator, and it really wasn't too hard to get set up. Um, so this is the simulator. I guess this is what it's going to look like. Uh, we can see we have some buttons and some text, and I think there's like a, a crank wheel on the side or something like that. <laughs> I'm not really too sure, but uh, you can use this to reset it. Anyways, <clears throat> we need to figure out how this is working and uh, how we can get the flag. It looks like to get the flag, you kind of type in a message. We find out later. I don't think that's actually the case. Uh, I think you have to like fully reverse it, but um, it was fun to play with it and see what it looks like. <clears throat> to actually solve the challenge uh, was a journey. Uh, we need to decompile Lua code. Uh, and for some reason, you can't just like natively decompile the Playdate Lua code because 
I guess the opcodes are different or something like that. Uh, I'm not really too sure. Uh, thankfully, there's some very smart people online and they figured out how to do it. And they had some patches that I found. Um, actually, I might be able to just find it. Uh, play date unlock uh, pat. Oh yeah, this one. So uh, thank you uh, for releasing these patches because uh, they worked. And so basically what we're going to do is we're going to take the this Java project called unluac and we're going to apply these patches and then we can run the Lua decompiler on it um, to get out the Lua code. And then from there, it's pretty easy to figure out. Um, to actually get uh, the Lua code, I can only find it in, uh, in Mercurial. Um, I didn't find any Git repos that had it. So uh, you can just search around and then you do like an HG clone sort of thing um, and you'll have it. Uh, from there, I was also using the patch-p1 command to try to apply these patches. Uh, for some reason, it wasn't working well. Um, I didn't really look into it too much because the patches really aren't that big. And I was kind of curious to see what they were patching. So I just manually went through and just copied out all the changes. Um, everything lined up pretty easily. Uh, like I said, I think the, the tricky thing was these opcodes are a little bit different, uh, I'm guessing, which is why it wasn't quite working if you just try to run the tool natively. Um, but yeah, uh, you pretty much just do that, apply these patches, and then you can you need to recompile it. Uh, there's instructions uh, for decompiling and, oh, sorry, recompiling the unluac jar binary. Uh, once you do that, uh, I don't know if I'm going to have any of the commands saved. Um, but yeah, this is basically how you run it. Java jar build unluac uh, dot jar. You can compile it. Uh, if we do Java C, um, this is, I guess, how I was able to compile it. Um, I had to do one thing where I had to copy over a manifest file. But like I said, if you Google online, eventually you'll find some instructions on how to do it. Um, it's just compiling a Java project. Uh, from there, um, we're able to decompile it and we'll get our own Lua code. Um, the Lua code looks like this. Uh, so there's like a bunch of little functions like generate flag and clean and a bunch of stuff. Eventually you find the winning condition happens when press buttons is equal to generate order. And so if you go up to generate order, um, there's some code that's just going to append together all the numbers from 1 to 20, uh, which is a little bit strange because the buttons don't map out that way. So there's no way we would be able to get that input. Um, but whatever, not a problem. Uh, so I copied that code out just to make sure I was understanding it correctly into here. Um, so this is the pin seed that it generates. And this is it calls some clean function on that to uh, actually print it out, um, print out the flag. So I just copied the, those two codes out and we can run it. Um, and so from there, I think it's Lua uh, doo -doo -doo, first date. Oops. And then, oh, I'm. it's actually, uh, I think it's in here. Test.lua. We can run it and we get this out. Um, so it's just some random string. If you wrap that in a sun uh, and then brackets, uh, that was the flag. Next is scripting DDR. Um, there's some text and a netcat port. And if we go to the netcat port, um, it gives us some instructions. We press enter and basically we're just supposed to whoops, type out these characters and we're supposed to do it quickly. Um, so kind of a generic scripting challenge. So we can write a script for that. Um, in the, actually in the background, I'm going to start running the solver because it does take a second. Um, but uh, the script is doing as you would expect. Uh, it connects. I use phone tools for this. Uh, it's going to wait for press enter to start. It's going to hit enter a couple times. Then it's going to receive that line. Um, and so we can kind of see it here. It's printing out the line there. Uh, and then it's going to go through character to character. If it's you know this left, we're going to append an A. If it's a right, we're going to append a D. Uh, we just go through. If it's unknown, print it. I should exit, um, but uh, for some reason I'm not. And then once we have that that line, we just do p dot send out, and we wait for the next line. Um, I forget how many rounds it is, but maybe a couple hundred or something like that. Um, but once you've done a couple hundred, uh, it'll print out the flag and that was it. Sweet. Uh, after a couple of minutes, it is done and it says your prize is Sun, do robots know how to dance? The next three challenges are Simon Programmer 1, 2, and 3, all in the scripting category. Um, there's a lot of text, but basically just go to this URL. Not Venmo, that's strange. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to hear this, but it's playing a bunch of different frequencies in the back. And uh, basically, we just need to copy the numbers that they just played. Um, if there's three of them, uh, they're probably going to get more difficult with time, and they definitely do. Um, so we can't just like copy it. Maybe we could do it for the first one, but definitely not the rest of them. Um, if you go through the JavaScript file, you'll find a couple of interesting things. One, there's this like load frequencies thing that's happening at the start. And if we take a look at that network request, uh, let me go back and hit play again. Uh, it's going to make a request to this frequencies thing. And so these are the frequencies it's playing. Um, and I think it does it by like groups of 10. Um, and then we need to go through and click it again. Um, so, but keep in mind, we have a list of frequencies. And then at the very end, to get the flag, 
we do this post call to the flag endpoint, and we're just going to send the frequencies. Uh, and so this frequency is just generated by all of our clicks. We click on a frequency and we send the frequency. The challenge gets a little bit weird in different le levels, like the front end doesn't even work in the later levels because uh, you need to send the, the frequencies and you don't actually have the frequencies. Um, so this website's a little bit contrived, but basically we need to just send that endpoint these frequencies. So we need to send it an array with 6,000, 6,000, 6,000, 9999, 1,000, 9999, blah, blah, blah. Um, and if you do that, you'll get back the flag. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have my original solve script because I spent so much time on Simon 2 and I copied it over to Simon 1 to see if it would work on Simon 1. Um, but basically, it's just two network requests, uh, first or three actually. First, you need to establish a session with request. Um, I'll talk about this more in the, in the next one, um, but you just do request.session and so that way you have cookies. Um, then you're going to request this frequencies file um, and you're just going to go through and split out the numbers. You only want the numbers. And then you're just going to post it to that endpoint and you get back the flag. Um, so that was Simon 1. Uh, it was kind of a joke because they're just sending you the frequencies you're supposed to guess. I mean, they're giving you the answers and then you just submit the answers. Um, for Simon 2, it was a little bit different. Um, uh, Simon 2. Uh, let's go to the URL. Uh, I didn't copy. So this time we don't actually have the frequencies. Um, so if we were to hit play, um, I'm just going to go to the frequencies endpoint. I think it's frequencies. Yeah. Um, we can see it's going to play these frequencies, uh, but the frequencies are obfuscated somehow. Uh, and we still need to submit the numbers for all of these, like the frequency number itself. Um, so that's why the UI is a little bit broken. If you like had perfect memory and were like clicking through the UI, it would send all of these names. Um, but really, we need to be sending the, the numbers. Um, anyway, so the solution to this is, I think there's might be some way to decode this. Um, I thought someone in Discord said something about that. Um, but uh, for me and for the next challenge, uh, it's, I think it's just better to like figure out what the actual frequency is. Uh, and so for that, we need to script it. Uh, let me go to Simon Programmer 2. So I spent a lot of time on this challenge just because uh, the, the fast Fourier transform I was using wasn't getting the exact frequency, which was a little bit annoying. So you had to try a bunch of different methods until one eventually worked. I do wish the endpoint gave you more information about like which one was wrong or something like that, but um, it is what it is. Uh, anyways, this is uh, the solution. So we're going to create a sessions just so that way we have cookies. Um, from there, we're going to grab a list of frequencies. And then for each of those frequency files, we're going to download it. Um, so I just save it. And then from here, I had a, just a bunch of different methods for actually calculating frequencies. The one that ended up working for me was using some library called Obio. Um, so if we go to this, I just, again, I just Googled around and found it. Sorry, let me actually back up. This is the one that I, I was using. Uh, this is like your very standard. If you want to convert from the time domain to the frequency domain, use an algorithm called Fast Fourier Transform. Um, and basically what's going to happen is like, uh, like by default, these wave files, you know, they're just going to be like a sinusoidal wave. They're just going to go up and down and up and down at a specific frequency. And so if you were to sample that, you know, you'd have a bunch of little points along the sine wave. When you run the fast Fourier transform uh, and you were to plot it, instead, you're just going to have a spike at that one frequency. So it's kind of converting from time to frequency domain. So anyways, that's the fast Fourier transform. Um, and so basically, it's just going to go through. It's going to calculate the fast Fourier transforms. This is going to figure out the fast Fourier transform buckets. And then it's going to figure out the, the highest point. And from there, it's going to return the frequency. Um, this isn't quite exact because it's going to bucket. I think it buckets by like five frequency. So it's going to have buckets for like 800 and 805 and 810. And it turns out that the challenge needed a little bit higher uh, accuracy than that. Um, so this method just doesn't work, unfortunately. Like I said, eventually I used some library called Obio. Um, and it does a couple of different ways to figure out what they call the pitch. Um, I guess this is a yin method. Um, anyways, you just this is the code I ended up using. I just copied it from online. Um, and basically it returns uh, a, uh, a frequency that is correct or more correct, I guess. Um, cool, so like I said, I just I send it over to this function to calculate the frequency for each of the files and then I just send it back. So for each of those frequencies, I call it, yeah, call it audio frequency. I append it into some out array, oops. Um, and then I send it over to the flag file and that was it. If we actually, we can actually run this one, python3 solve.py. Let's see if it's working. I think Obvio or something takes a second to get set up. Uh, I'm not too sure why. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to have to install the, the, the library. All right. Now that they're installed, hopefully it'll work. Um, cool. 
So uh, yeah, this is just calculating the frequencies that I printed out. So this specific file, my naive implementation using fast forward transform calculated this one. Abio calculated this frequency. You can see they're a little bit different, like specifically this one. If I round it, so 1740 or 1741. Um, so maybe that's what made the difference between that and the solution. But anyways, uh, we send that over to the flag endpoint and eventually we get back to the flag. So it says, son, Simon says, wait, that was a mistake. What do you mean the file names were frequencies? So I'm guessing somehow we could still could have cheese this one. Uh, I'm not too sure. Um, and then for the last one, uh, basically uh, this code works fine. You can just run it on the last one. So you can just change that two into a three and run it again. Oh, I canceled out of Ubuntu, dang it. Um, actually, we can still run it. We can actually use the old code, uh, the old frequency method. We don't need the obvio one. Um, so we're just gonna do freak. We can just do standard fast forward transform and it should just work. And we don't need obvio anymore. And we'll see if it works. Um, three is the same one. It's just the frequencies go a little bit higher. Uh, and yeah, you can just use fast forward transform on that one. And it says sun. Simon says automated solve or bust. So interesting challenge. This is web beep boop blog. Um, there's some text, but one of uh, the important thing in the text is apparently somewhere there's a secret draft and we're given a URL. Uh, if we go to the blog, um, there's just a whole bunch of different posts by different robots. Um, if we look at the network request, We'll see there's this request to post and it's just a whole bunch of different posts. And the post also has a URL, which has an ID. Um, it said something about a secret draft. So maybe there's a post that's missing. Um, so what we can do is uh, script it and see which one of the post IDs is not being returned to us. Um, so to do that, I used request. Uh, here's request, here's the base URL. Um, I grab it, I grab the JSON. Um, from there, I'm gonna collect all the URLs just to see which one's missing. So I go through each one of the post things, grab the URL, add it to the post directory. Then I go through, uh, I saw the, the highest one I saw was like 1024. So I go through and I make sure all of the URLs exist. And if it doesn't, um, I request that URL and I print out the text. Um, so Python 3, solve that pi. Uh, we go through, we run through all of them. And apparently one of the posts was missing. Uh, I'm not sure, apparently post 608 was missing. Uh, and if you request it, it says hidden true post sun whoops all idor. So insecure direct object reference. Um, so fun. Next is web hot dog stand. Uh, we're given some text and a URL. If we, don't if we open up the URL, we can see there's a login portal. Um, since everything has to do with robots, we might as well just check robots.txt. And this time there is a robot.txt. Uh, the only one that works is this hot dog database. So if we go there, uh, we'll see it downloaded a robots uh, database. Um, so let's go check that out. Uh, file robot data dot db. Uh, we can see it's a SQLite. So let's open SQLite on robot data dot db. Uh, we can do tables. Uh, there's three tables. Uh, we can check out the schema for credentials. Um, that looks good. So let's do select star from uh, credentials. And we can line these up. So the username is hot dog stand and the password is sliced pickles and onions. So hot dog stand. We go back to the website, hot dog stand. We type in that password and that was it. Please take your authentication token, uh, sliced pickles and onions. This is Pwn Array of Sunshine. Uh, there's a bunch of text. We're given a netcat port and a download file. Um, so if we open this up in Ghidra, um, there's a couple of functions. The main function is this basket function. And what's gonna happen is it's going to ask us for an index into this global fruits array and we get to replace one of the fruits. Um, the, like I said, the, the fruits is in the global section. And another interesting thing also in the global data section is the global offset table. And so to exploit this, what we can do is we can set an index that's out of bounds. They're not really doing any bounds check. It should be from zero to three, but they're not actually gonna check that index. And we're gonna send an index such that instead of overwriting within the fruits array, it's going to overwrite an entry in the global offset table and we're gonna overwrite the entry for exit with the win function. And this binary did have a win function here. Um, and so uh, once we do that, um, when it calls exit, it'll instead call win and we should get the flag. Uh, to see what this looks like um, in a solve script, uh, this is uh, just a generic pwn tool solve script, uh, importing some stuff, turning off warnings, I shouldn't, but I do. Uh, we're loading the elf, setting some context. Uh, and here we're going to connect to the remote process. Um, so like I said, we're gonna calculate, uh, we're gonna send an offset. So instead of being in the fruits array, we wanna overwrite the global offset table entry for exit. 
Um, and so to calculate that offset, we're just going to subtract the two and then divide it by eight because it's going to be accessing, you know, by long bytes. Um, so I print out that uh, offset. And so when the process asks what offset I want, I'm just going to send that offset. And it, when it asks for what fruit do I want to replace it with, uh, instead of a fruit, we're going to send the address for that win symbol. Uh, and that should be it. So let's do make Ubuntu 22. So we're going to run Python solve. Uh, if we scroll up a little bit, the index is actually minus eight. So that means it's minus 64 bytes. Um, so we send that minus eight, then we replace it with a new fruit. The new fruit we're going to send is the, this address 4012.8f, which is the win function. And after that, the program calls exit, but it doesn't actually exit, instead it wins, and we get the flag. It says sun, a ray of sunshine bouncing around. So fun. This is Pwn Flock of Seagulls. Uh, it has some text. Uh, we're given a netcat port and a download file. Um, if we open it up in Ghidra, uh, there's a win function, which is nice. Uh, there's a main function, just going to print a bunch of stuff. Um, there's also then uh, a series of five functions that all call each other. And so they're going down. So func1 calls func2, which calls func3, which calls func4, which calls func5. And eventually in func5, uh, it's going to read some input. And this input is actually a buffer overflow. You might have noticed that as we were going through, uh, some of these functions had uh, checks. And specifically, they're checking the return address. And so the, what's happening is it knows where the return address is stored on the stack. And it's making sure that the return address was not clobbered. Um, so this challenge isn't like a real exploitation challenge. I guess it's not a realistic one. It's one that's more testing your fundamentals and making sure you understand how a stack frame is kind of laid out. Um, so what's going to happen is we're going to be able to use this buffer overflow to overwrite all those stack frames and all those return addresses and all those base pointers. Um, but we need to actually construct it correctly. Otherwise, these checks will fail and we won't be able to do our ROP or you know our RET to win or whatever we want to do. Um, so for example, when we do the buffer overflow here, we need to make sure that we set the return address to this function on the stack to the correct value, which is 401276. Um, but as long as we do that correctly, we can see this func1 uh, doesn't do such check when it does a return. So instead of returning back to main, we can return to win. Um, and that should be good. Somewhere in here, there's also a leak. Um, maybe I'm missing it. I thought it was leaking something. Maybe it leaks it up here. Oh yeah, uh, here we also get a link. A leak, it says the song begins at, and it gives us a percent %p to local 10. So it's giving us a stack pointer, which we need to construct all the base pointers and making sure they're in the right spot. So to do this buffer overflow, like I said, we just need to make sure we put all the values in the correct spot. Um, probably the easiest way is just loading up GDB. Um, so we can do GDB flock. Uh, let's do a run. Um, so we can see we have our leak here. Uh, I'm going to do cancel. Then I'm going to do step, oh, not start. Uh, dang it. <laughs> uh, cancel, uh, single step. And then I'm going to type in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's do eight A's. Cool. Now we can start inspecting the stack and see what's up. Uh, cool. Uh, this is enough. Yeah, this is enough for now. Um, cool. So here is our buffer overflow, uh, all A's. Uh, cool. And so we can see uh, we're going to, if we do this buffer overflow, we're going to start writing down. So there's a bunch of stuff in the stack frame. The rest of the stack frames are very small. We can see here is the base pointer. Um, so this is the uh, value that's going to be popped off into RBP and it starts uh, the next stack frame. And here is the return address. So when this uh, when this code eventually calls ret or this function calls ret, um, this is where it's going to jump to. So like I said, we have a buffer overflow and we're going to write all the way down. So when we write down, we can clobber all of this stuff. That's fine. But we need to make sure that we set the correct base pointer because eventually base pointers are going to be popped off and hit set of stack pointers and stuff. Um, we just need to make sure they're correct. We also need to make sure um, that this return address is correct. If we keep going down the stack, um, so there was func4. Func4 eventually is going to return to func3. So we can see here's func3. Here is the base pointer for func3. Here's func2, the base pointer, and here's func1 and the base pointer. And here's the return address for func1, which normally returns to main. But here is where we're going to put the address of win. So like I said, the trick to this is just we need to put the correct values in the right spot. <laughs> Pwn Tools makes this very simple. Uh, they have a nice little utility called Pwn Flat. Um, so this is the solve script. Um, that kind of helps us organize uh, challenges like this. So each one of these entries, so when we do this buffer overflow, each one of these entries is eight bytes. So you'll see here, all these keys are multiplied by eight. And what this is saying is the 16th offset into this payload we're eventually going to be sent needs to have this value. So what Pwn Flat's gonna do is it's gonna take all these keys and values and construct a payload such that uh, at least the following is true. And then it's gonna fill out the rest with a uh, random garbage. Um, so at whatever 16 times eight is, uh, it'll have 
the following eight bytes. And whatever 17 times eight is, at that offset into the array that we're going to send it, it'll have this value. And pwn.flat also does a good job of converting things uh, uh, into packed integers. So normally you wouldn't send it like this. You need to make sure you respect like the big Indian and little Indianness. Um, anyways, so to calculate those values, what you can do is you come up to A, and we can see this is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Uh, I think I counted wrong. Anyways, if you count it correctly, this should be 16. Let's do that again. I probably forgot the 0. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. There we go. Now we got to 16. So I'm saying at address 16, so the RBP that's about to be packed off, uh, put in the value of leak plus this. Um, so the leak value is changing every time. Uh, basically, what I do is I just you just run the program once. So you take the leak, um, whatever the leak was on this execution, it's up there somewhere, the leak we got, and you subtract what it's supposed to be, or you add. Uh, sometimes you get it reversed. In this case, it was just subtract. Um, take the value that's on the stack and subtract the leak you got and add it to your current leak. These, this value is always going to be constant. You're just gonna it's going to be a relative offset from the leak you're given. Hopefully that made sense. Um, and then we need to overwrite the return address. So we're going to return to func4. Um, this was already there. So it's this value. We just need to make sure when we buffer flow overflow this whole thing, we're not clobbering this value. So we just reset it. Um, and then next, you just keep going down. So that was 17, then 18, 19, 20. Here's the next base pointer. Here's the next return address. And like I said, you just go through, um, add all the values. And then at the very end, uh, we're going to set the win. There's one minor thing um, that happens. Uh, it's not too big of a deal. The stack was unaligned. So what I actually do is um, on versions of libc, sometimes you need to make sure the stack pointer ends in a zero and not an eight. So like this, this is a stack value, not a stack pointer, but you basically you need it to end the stack pointer RSP and set in the zero instead of eight because there's certain instructions that are 16 byte aligned um, and for versions of libc use it. So every once in a while, if you get like some weird like m maps or m vaps uh, on a 16 bit byte wide instruction, uh, if you just put another return address in there, um, the stack pointer will move down by one, uh, and that'll fix it. Anyways, uh, then we jump to the win address, and that was it. So really not too bad of a challenge if you know what you're doing. Uh, Python 3, solve.py. Uh, let's see if we have shell, and we do. So we can cat out the flag. Uh, sun here, then there, then everywhere. This is Pwn bug spray. Uh, we're given a bunch of text, a netcat port, and a download file. Uh, so this challenge was interesting. Um, Again, it's not like a real exploitation challenge. It's one of those like, I guess, checking challenges to see if you can like bypass some checks. Um, so this binary is some ham rolled assembly, and there's just a couple of different checks and flows that you need to bypass. And if you do, you're able to read the flag off of disk. Um, so it starts out. It's going to print out a prompt. So that's this first if call. It's going to move one into eax. So that's right. Um, so it's going to write the prompt. EDI is the uh, the file descriptor, file descriptor one for standard out, and it's uh, OXC bytes. Um, afterwards, it's going to do this next syscall. This is going to be a mmap. It's going to set up this address so that you can execute, read, write, and execute at this address. And eventually, the, the challenge is going to ask us for a shellcode, and it's going to be placed at this address. So that's why it's turning on the execute bits. Um, then it's going to uh, execute this next shellcode. Um, this is going to move zero into EAX. So it's going to do a read on standard in at this address for however many bytes this is, um, 500 bytes. So we have a 500 byte uh, uh, input where we're allowed to put presumably shellcode if they're going to put execute on the uh, memory map protection. Cool. Uh, this is where things get a little bit interesting, uh, a little bit strange. So RAX after the syscall is going to have the number of bytes uh, that were read. And so if our shell code is, you know, OX50, then RAX is OX50. And now it's going to do 20 add to RAX. So then it would be like OX70, just an example. Uh, it's going to move this over and it's going to compare the RAX value with R10, which is was set up here, is OX64. And if it's less than, it's going to jump to this bug spray function. We'll find out later the bug spray function is bad. And then it's going to compare it with R11, which is OX66. And if it's uh, greater than or equal to, we're also going to jump to that bad function. Um, so that means our RAX uh, can either be 65 or 64, um, just because it's not a it's only a jump jump less than, not a jump less than or equal. Um, so we have two different values for RAX, um, and there's also that add 20 we just need to think about later. 
Um, cool. So as long as we didn't jump into bug spray, junk, bug spray just does a bunch of bad stuff and eventually the process will crash. So that's not what we want. It'll eventually clear out these registers and call syscall again. And then it's going to test the result of that syscall. And if it is zero, so if RAX is zero, it'll jump to off. And off is what we want. Off will then execute the shell code we sent earlier. The two syscalls that it can call with RAX because it has to be in between those bounds are ptrace and the time syscall, like get time. Uh, get time will never return zero. So that's not the syscall we want. Um, so we definitely want the ptrace one. Um, and the ptrace one is just going to check if there's a debugger attached. So if you run it in GDB, it's not going to work. But if you run it without GDB, uh, it will work. It'll return zero. And uh, we'll be able to jump to this off function or this off label. And so the off label, very simple. It's just going to clear RDX. It's going to move this value into EDX. And then it's going to jump to that value. Um, and so this is just where our shellcode is. It just basically jumps to our shellcode. Um, so strange challenge. So basically, our only really restriction is we're allowed to send shellcode. It just needs to be a certain length. And we can make it any length um, by just appending nops onto it. Um, cool. There was another thing. So the first thing I did then was I sent over pwn shellcraft.shell, like a generic, you know, open up uh, or spawn shell. Um, for some reason, that wasn't working. Uh, I'm not too sure why. Maybe bin shell didn't exist or something like that. Um, I did a couple other things to see if, like, if it was actually working. Like, I, I didn't know what to expect. Um, so you can do a shell. I think it's like crash or trap or something like that. <clears throat> and you'll see that it, <clears throat> the process does trap, which is interesting. And then you can also, to test it, you can do a pwn.shellcraft.write one and then RSP and I think I did like you know OX10 or something like that and if you if it writes out 10 bytes of the stack um, and you get a response you know that your shell code is executing so that's how I was able to show that the execute it was executing it's just for some reason it wasn't spawning bin shell um, I don't know why um, so instead uh, we're just going to do an ORW open read write so I sent over or wrote some shell code I didn't write shell code or sorry pwn tools is doing everything for me uh, pwn tools will create the shell code to open flag text create the shell code to read um, the file descriptor. So presumably this will open up file descriptor three. Um, I did do a write of the value of EAX back to me just to confirm that it was three. Um, most likely it's three though. You got standard in, standard error, and standard out, or sorry, standard in, standard out, and standard error. So most likely zero, one, two, it would be three. Um, so we're gonna read onto the stack pointer for 64 bytes, and then we're gonna write out to standard out the stack pointer for 64 bytes. So it's just gonna read a uh, file and print it out. Um, yeah, and that was it. And we need to make sure we justify the code to OX 44 bytes because eventually it's going to add that OX 20 and do that check with ptrace and stuff. So it just needs to be OX 44 bytes long. Um, but otherwise, well, once you know what to do, it really wasn't too bad. Very short code. Uh, we can try running it. Uh, make Ubuntu 22, Python 3, solve that pi. And cool, we got it. Uh, the flag was sun, mosquitoes, and horseflies, and triangle bugs. Oh my. So interesting challenge. The next challenge is Pwn House of Sus. Uh, we're given a bunch of text, something to do with imposters and Among Us. We're also given libc, which is very nice. Oops, uh, definitely need that. And we're given a netcat port, the linker, and a download file. Um, cool. So this challenge was based off of a old and very common uh, heap exploitation technique called House of Force. Um, to use House of Force, there's a couple of different things that kind of point towards House of Force. Uh, the first is uh, if you go through the code, there's this function. Again, it's all like Among Us themed. There's this function called call emergency meeting, and we get to call malloc with a size of our choosing. Uh, so that's necessary. We also need a way to write past the bounds of a malloc chunk, and we can also do that with this function. So we can say we want to size a malloc chunk of 16 bytes, but then it'll read in OX 40 bytes. It's always OX 40. Um, so we can request a small chunk and overwrite it so that we can overwrite whatever is next in the, the heap. Um, once you have those two and also the libc version, uh, the libc version used for the challenge is 227. Um, that's a, an old libc version and it is also vulnerable to the house of force exploit. Um, so putting all those together, you can probably figure that this is a house of force uh, exploitation challenge. Um, there might be other methods too. Um, just house of force is common and uh, it's not too bad. Um, cool. So we have house of force. So if you're not familiar with it, uh, what is it? Um, actually before that, uh, if you're new to these, uh, Another very useful trick, you might notice that in here I have house of sus and house of sus patched. Um, there's a tool called pwn in it. Um, you can find if you Google. And basically what this will do is it'll do some magic such that your binary, uh, this house of sus, will use the libc in the local folder instead of the libc on your system. And this is necessary for making sure your exploits work remotely because um, otherwise you're going to be using a local libc, which is probably like, you know, 
234 or 235 or something like that if you're on a modern version of Ubuntu. And uh, we definitely want to be using 27. So anyways, once we have House of Sloths patched, oops, we can run GDB. Uh, let's click one. Uh, another thing is they also give us a heap leak, which is nice. Um, cool. So let's look at a couple things. So let's look at VM map. Um, so this is how the process is laid out. We can see that the heap is here. And during this exploit, uh, what we're going to be able to do is create heap chunks such that we can overwrap the entire memory space uh, and end the heap like here, let's say, and so that when you request the next heap chunk, uh, it'll be at a location you want. Uh, normally, this is like the global offset table. Um, I'm, I'll cover this again because I think that's a lot. Um, but basically, like you, you, we're going to create heap chunks that are very, very, very large, like impossibly large, um, and not actually do anything with them so that the heap thinks that its next heap chunk to allocate will be like at the global offset table. And so when you request the next heap chunk, it'll just be at the global offset table, even though it's not in the heap. Um, it's, you know, some address way outside the heap. The heap doesn't know any better. Um, it doesn't do any checks. And, you know, the heap needs to be fast. Um, so it's not going to do too, too many checks. Um, and so now we can just start overriding entries in the global offset table. Anyways, um, as part of the heap, there's something, let's do this heap chunk. Uh, so these, this is, we're visualizing the heap. Normally it's not this messy. Um, I'm just very zoomed in. Um, but these are the different heap chunks that are allocated right now. There isn't too much. At the very end of the heap, there's this thing called the top chunk. And this is how much space the heap thinks it still has less, or left, sorry. Um, and uh, so right now, the end of the heap is, you know, whatever this address is plus this address. So what we're going to do is first, we're going to allocate a small chunk. Um, so pretend it'll be like down here somewhere, but we'll just pretend it's right here. We're going to allocate a small chunk and use that buffer overflow such that we can overwrite this value here. And what we're going to do is we're going to overwrite the top chunk and we're going to put in OX. F -f 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 cool. So now the heap thinks that, um, you know, it has pretty much unlimited size. Then what we're going to do is we're going to ask for another heap chunk and we're going to ask for a size of like OX F -f 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 minus like OX or something like that. I don't know. Maybe actually it's more like this, something around here. And so what's going to happen is we're going to get an absolutely ginormous chunk. We're not going to do anything with it, um, but the heap is going to see that, you know, the top chunk is big enough. I have plenty of space. Um, I'm just going to allocate it. But what's going to happen is the addresses are going to wrap. So, and if you add two addresses that are bigger than that, you know, you're just going to have, it's just going to wrap around. Um, and so we're really, after doing this, uh, the next heap chunk, uh, the, it's going to think that the next heap chunk starts at like address OX, uh, 306A90, if this is really, you know, 100,000 or whatever. Um, hopefully that made sense. Um, so the heap now thinks, you know, where's my starting address? It's going to be, you know, all the way wrapped around. And then I said minus 1,000. So, you know, at 30069B0 or whatever. Um, and so then when we press, request a new heap chunk, the heap thinks it's at, you know, OX30697 or whatever. Um, we get a chunk there and we can overwrite whatever contents are there. So using this, we can, this primitive, we have an arbitrary write anywhere in memory we want, um, as long as we know the heap address and the address of where we're going to write, um, which is pretty crazy. And that's why it's such a powerful primitive. Um, cool. Just to recap, because that was a lot, what we're going to do is we're going to create a chunk. We're going to overwrite past the bounds to set the top chunk to be OX, you know, FFFFFF as big as possible. Then we're going to allocate an absolutely huge chunk that overwrites and overflows the address such that the heap now thinks that the start of the heap is, you know, some interesting target like OX, you know, the global offset table, you know, wherever that is. Um, so like this would be a nice place. So we'll stop the heap like right here. And then when we request our next chunk, let's say we ask for a chunk of like, you know, 32 bytes, it'll return this as our heap chunk. And then we can write whatever we want to write right here and just overwrite the global offset table entries. Um, cool. There's a couple of complex things about this. Um, if we go back into the code, there's probably an easier way to solve it than I did. Uh, there was like a win function in here. Um, I forget what it was called. Uh, doo -doo -doo, sussy generate call. The B imposter, yeah. So it, it'll call exec VE um, if we can pass in uh, the file correctly. So I'm guessing somehow we were supposed to call uh, this uh, file, but I'm not really sure how. Um, so I didn't use that. Instead, I used one gadgets. If you're not familiar with one gadgets, one gadgets are a like a absolutely magic tool such that if you jump to this location within libc, uh, by just doing a single jump, it'll call exec VE on bin shell. Um, so you can get shell as long as you have a single arbitrary jump and you know what libc version is running and you also have the libc leak. Um, so that's what I ended up using. Um, to do that, we need a libc leak. 
Uh, and so I used House of Force to get a libc leak. Maybe there's one in the, the program. I just didn't see it. Um, what I ended up doing was there's these task objects in the global data section. And so these this is task object is an array of care stars. And so you can see it's just like uh, the first entry is this pointer, whatever, 42D F, uh, 4F. I'm actually sorry, it's this one. Keycher's being, it just duplicates it twice. It's 42D 4F, which is this string over here. Uh, you completed all your wires. And so these are the imposter among us task. But if we can uh, do house of force and such that it ends at this address, and then allocate this chunk so that we can start overwriting these values, what we could do is we could overwrite the global offset table entry right here, such that next time it prints out a task, instead of printing out these strings, it'll print out the global offset table values, which will have libc values. Um, so that's how I have a libc leak. Then I'm going to do the house of force again to overwrite. And I'm going to go back to the global offset table, wherever that is, you know, somewhere around here. Uh, and we'll start overwriting the global offset table values with the uh, one gadgets. There's another complication in there. The one gadget sometimes has very specific conditions about stack alignment and like other conditions about what register values. I couldn't find a clean way to get them to work. So when I overwrite the global offset table values, I have one of them actually jumps to another function that then calls the global offset table value just so the stack is a little bit better aligned. And the only way, I, there's probably an easier way to solve this. I, I feel like I was doing it wrong, but to do that, it was just guess and check work. It really wasn't too exciting. But anyways, uh, so putting that all together, uh, this is what the solve script looks like. So this is all very standard pwn tool stuff, nothing too exciting. When we first join or start the process, we get that heap leak, which we need. Um, so we're going to save that heap leak. I put made this function, create heap chunk. Um, so that's going to do that emergency meeting. Or we can actually just run the process real quick. Oops. House of such patched. So we, for example, if we call emergency meeting, that's the one we like. It says, oh, you've been called out. How many characters will you respond to? 16. And what is your response? AAA. So we created a malloc chunk of 16 and we set A's to all those bytes. Then there's like the, some imposter stuff. I don't really do anything with it. Um, it doesn't really matter. But we can recall call emergency meeting and just do that malloc allocate as many times as we want. So that's the create chunk, just the create a meeting, allocate a chunk, and put some contents in there. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set that top chunk within the heap to OXFFFFF. So we're creating a chunk of size 32. We're going to do the overflow in the heap. And this is overriding the top chunk. So now the heap thinks it has pretty much you know, unlimited write capabilities. Uh, cool. Then we're going to do the house to force exploit and wrap to the task object. Cool. So um, uh, yeah. So the, the heap address is where I calculate where I currently am in the heap based off of the heap leak. Um, you just kind of massage values around and play in GDB until you figure it out. I just printed it out a bunch of times, but basically this is where I am in the heap with this chunk currently. Um, this is where I want to go. And then I subtract it from OXFF because OXFF is going to do that full wrap and then minus whatever is here. Um, so cool. Uh, that's how I get to LTAS. So now the heap, when I request a new chunk, it'll be at the task object, which is, is that array of care stars. Uh, cool. I'm going to create a chunk. And so this will be the task object, and I'm going to send in uh, five uh, global offset table entries for free. Cool. So then when you do your task, um, it'll say you just fake keys trying to metagame. You completed all your wires. Instead of saying these strings, uh, there's five different tasks. It's going to say it's going to give us that libc leak for free for the free entry, not for free. Um, cool. So once we do that, we'll leak libc. We'll just grab it. So we'll call that meeting. Like I said, just press one. We get it out, we get the libc leak, we print it out, we calculate the base of libc, um, and it's just whatever the leak was minus where the symbol of for free is. We're then going to do the house of force exploit again. Um, so we're going to overwrite that top chunk and we're going to set it to all Fs. Then we're going to wrap all the way around, except for minus OX168. The global offset table entry is very close. Um, it's just 168 bytes up. So we're just going to subtract 168 bytes. Um, so now the next entry we request will be at the global offset table entry. Uh, then I create a chunk here. Um, this is the one gadget. So these are those addresses that if you are able to jump to them, they'll immediately call bin shell as long as you meet the conditions. Um, so I'll calculate that target. Um, and then I'm going to request the chunk on the global offset table. I'm going to write three of those targets out. And then I write an extra target out. Um, and this is just because, uh, let's run one gadget real quick. One gadget on libc. Um, we'll see that certain conditions have to be met, like specifically RSP has to end in a zero, RCX has to be null, you know, the stack address has to be null. Um, by default, I couldn't get any of those conditions to be true. So instead, what I do is I overwrite one of the global offset table entries with this malloc call instead, uh, the address of a malloc call, and I over also overwrite the malloc call 
with the one gadget. And so when this call happens, it'll jump to another function. It just so happens that the stack is aligned correctly, that condition zero, this condition works out correctly, uh, and we're able to get shell. Not the coolest thing in the world, but it worked. Um, so let's try to run the exploit. Um, it says ls not found, which uh, means we're in shell, and there's the flag. So we can cut it out, cat flag.txt. And son, are you the imposter very sus? So fun challenge.